If you prescribe IV solutions or infuse them, then it's super important to understand what you're giving, the specific conditions they'd be contraindicated in, and the precautions you need to be aware of with each type. This way. In this video, I'm expanding on the information I reviewed here. So let's jump right in. Hypotonic solutions have an osmolarity or total particulate content that's less than 250 milliequivalents per liter. Hypotonic crystalloid solutions include half normal saline, 0.33% sodium chloride, 0.225% sodium chloride, and D2.5 sodium chloride or dextrose 2.5 in half normal saline. And these are used because they encourage the movement of fluid back into the cells. So generally, they're prescribed to provide hydration and to correct mild dehydration. So in these cases, it helps restore some fluid volume without overloading the body with too much salt. In patients with hypernatremia or hyperglycemia, which is high blood sodium or glucose levels, Hypotonic saline can be used to reduce these as it provides free water to dilute the plasma, which normalizes the electrolyte and glucose balance. After certain surgeries, especially those where patients are restricted from fluid intake, hypotonic solutions can be used to maintain hydration while avoiding sodium overload. And in some cases, hypotonic solutions are used as maintenance fluids to provide basic hydration when a patient's fluid requirements are relatively low, such as maybe certain postoperative periods or non-stressful recovery periods. And caution, excessive use of hypotonic solutions may lead to an overcorrection of the original problem and cause hemodilution or overly diluted blood plasma. And they're also not appropriate to administer with blood transfusions because they can cause hemolysis or a bursting of the red blood cells. So given the way these solutions function and move fluid, the following cautions should be considered prior to prescribing or infusing them. Brain swelling or increased intracranial pressure. And it's crucial to monitor patients for signs of cerebral edema or brain swelling. Hypotonic solutions don't contain sufficient concentrations of electrolytes like sodium, chloride, potassium. So prolonged use can result in imbalances, particularly hyponatremia, which can cause confusion, seizures, and coma. And these solutions are just generally not appropriate for patients that have increased risk for fluid and electrolyte imbalances, such as those with burns or severe trauma or certain kidney disorders and liver failure. Now liver failure often results in a decreased ability to produce proteins, including albumin, which helps maintain oncotic pressure in the blood vessels and prevents the leakage of fluid from vessels into tissues, making patients more prone to fluid accumulation and edema. Liver failure also increases the risk of hepatic encephalopathy, which is a condition characterized by neurological dysfunction. Low sodium levels caused by hypotonic solutions can worsen hepatic encephalopathy and increase the risk of cerebral edema or brain swelling, which can be absolutely life-threatening. And of course, we know the liver plays a critical role in detoxification of the body and metabolizing drugs and toxins. Using hypotonic solutions may alter drug distribution and clearance of these medications, leading to an unpredictable drug effect or potential toxicity. Now, the rate at which hypotonic solutions are administered should be controlled carefully. Rapid infusion of large volumes can increase the risk of dilutional hyponatremia and cerebral edema. So the risk of cellular swelling in burn patients due to significant fluid loss through their wounds is another major reason why we don't use them in this instance. These solutions can exacerbate the problem by causing water to move into the cells, which is especially concerning in burn patients because this can further damage the already compromised tissue and potentially lead to compartment syndrome. 
So the use of hypotonic solutions in burn patients can also increase the risk of generalized edema and swelling throughout the body. And this can contribute to respiratory and cardiovascular complications, particularly with extensive burns. So hypertonic solutions are next and have an osmolarity that is greater than 375 milliequivalents per liter. So these solutions include 3% sodium chloride, 5% sodium chloride, 10% dextrose and water, D5 and half normal saline, D5.9 normal saline, and lactated ringer. So general uses. So hypertonic saline and dextrose are used because they encourage the movement of water out of the cells and tissues into the intravascular space, which then promotes diuresis, which helps the body just get rid of excess fluid and water through urination. And this can help reduce edema and increase urine output in conditions like heart failure and renal failure. Hypertonic saline solutions are used to rapidly correct serum hyponatremia, like low blood sodium levels. However, in the case of sodium chloride, infusing large quantities rapidly can lead to a severe acid-base imbalance because when there's an excess of chloride ions in the blood, this then leads to a decrease in blood pH and can cause hyperchloremic acidosis. So very important to be aware of this. These types of fluids are also administered to manage cerebral edema or brain swelling caused by conditions like traumatic brain injury, stroke, or brain tumors. And it helps to reduce intracranial pressure. In some cases of severe dehydration or shock, hypertonic solutions may be used to rapidly expand the intravascular volume or the plasma. So cautions, again, given the way hypertonic fluids function, be aware of the potential for osmotic fluid shifts, which can cause the fluid to move rapidly between compartments, the intravascular, interstitial, or intracellular compartments. And this can lead to cellular dehydration or peripheral edema. So make sure to adjust the infusion rates accordingly to minimize these shifts. A serious adverse event related to these solutions is osmotic demyelination syndrome. And this basically triggers a sudden shift of water out of the brain cells, but causes damage to the myelin sheaths, which are the fatty covering around the nerves as they shrink in the process. So because these solutions are so concentrated, they can wreak havoc if infusing them through small veins. So because of this, we like to use central venous access when administering these to reduce the risk of vein irritation and thrombosis or clotting. And these are what some of the central lines look like. This is a porta cath, this is a triple lumen catheter, and this is a PIC line. We're going to ensure that the chosen hypertonic solution is compatible with any medications or fluids being administered concurrently. Some medications may precipitate when mixed with hypertonic fluids like Dilantin, Amphotericin B, which I call Amphoterable, and Valium, just to name a few. Isotonic IV fluids have an osmolarity that's equal to blood plasma, which again is 275 to 300 milliosmoles per liter. And these solutions include normal saline or 0.9 sodium chloride, lactated ringers, or plasmolite or normosol. D5W is here, but again, I can't drive this point home enough. Recall that this solution can be both isotonic and hypotonic depending on if it's mixed with another solution. On its own, it's isotonic because the body will metabolize the sugar quickly and then this leaves the water behind, which will then have a lower osmolarity than blood plasma. If it's mixed with normal saline or lactated ringers, it starts out as a hypertonic solution, but winds up as an isotonic solution for the same reasons. And isotonic fluids are used because they do not move fluid in or out of the vascular space. They volume expand. They volume expand only. 
So generally, they're prescribed to maintain the intravascular volume. Solutions such as normal saline or lactated ringers are often used for fluid resuscitation in patients with hypovolemic shock, severe bleeding, or circulatory collapse. They help restore blood pressure and perfusion to vital organs. They have similar osmotic pressure to blood plasma, making them compatible with red blood cells and preventing their bursting or shrinkage. So due to this, they are often the diluent for packed red blood cells. Now, some isotonic solutions like lactated ringers or Normasol contain a balanced composition of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and these closely resemble the electrolyte composition of blood plasma. They are used to correct electrolyte imbalances or provide electrolyte support when needed. Now, cautions. You want to avoid rapid infusion, especially in patients with compromised cardiac and renal function. You also want to continuously monitor the patient's vital signs, including blood pressure, heart rate, respirations, and oxygen saturation, as changes may indicate fluid overload and present with edema, crackles in the lungs, and changes in mental status. And if you don't know what crackles in the lungs sound, if you take your hair and you rub it next to your ear, this is what you'll hear when you're auscultating lung sounds with somebody with crackles. Also, regularly check your patient's electrolyte levels to monitor for hemodilution or elevated levels of sodium, potassium, and chloride. Last, we come to colloid solutions, and these are IV fluids that contain suspended molecules that are relatively large compared to those in crystalloid solutions. So these large particles can't easily pass through semi-permeable membranes like blood vessels and cell walls. So these colloidal solutions include 5 and 25% human albumin, hydroxyethyl starch or HETA starch, pentastarch solutions, dextrin solutions, and then gelatin solutions. And they're used because they hold fluid in the vascular space. So generally, they're used to increase intravascular volume, maintain blood pressure, and replace plasma. So 5 and 25% human albumin are the most widely used colloidal IV solutions and are given for hypovolemia, cirrhosis endocytes, nephrotic syndrome, low albumin from malnutrition and burns, cardiopulmonary patients, paracentesis, and patients undergoing surgery. Cautions include hypersensitivity reactions, volume overload, and coagulation abnormalities. So we need to monitor allergies, electrolyte levels, and clotting factors such as PT, PCT, and INR closely. Pre-existing renal function issues are also a concern because they can lead to reduced clearance, which can cause prolonged effects and fluid overload. Contaminants and infections can also come into play here because this is considered a blood product and while precautions are taken to avoid transmission, it's not 100% guaranteed. So albumin is heated prior to infusion to reduce the risk of HIV and hepatitis C transmission. Dextran is composed of complex glucose molecules and is used less frequently today due to concerns about side effects, but they are used to expand blood volume and in certain clinical situations. So dextran has the potential to cause hypersensitivity reactions, including anaphylaxis in some individuals. Allergic reactions to dextran are rare, but can be severe. So again, obtaining a thorough allergy history prior to infusing is imperative. So dextran can also interfere with blood coagulation and platelet function, potentially increasing the risk of bleeding. So this effect can persist for several days after dextran administration. So the molecules in this solution are large and can affect renal function. They're excreted by the kidneys and excessive administration may lead to osmotic nephrosis, which is characterized by injury to renal tubular cells. 
Dextran solutions, like other colloidal solutions, can increase intravascular volume. So excessive administration or rapid infusion of dextran may lead to fluid overload or pulmonary edema, especially in patients with heart or kidney conditions. Are we, are we seeing a theme here? Yes. Yes, I am. I mean, the colloidal solutions are just, you just need to be super careful about fluid overload and taxing an already struggling cardiopulmonary or renal system. So monitoring intake and output lung sounds and vital signs is crucial because of the huge potential for the adverse effects. Crystalloid solutions or other colloid alternatives like albumin are preferred here. Next, we're talking about hydroxyethyl starches or HEDA starches. And their use has become much more selective in recent years due to safety concerns as well, which include renal impairment and kidney function as this solution has a high potential to cause acute kidney injury, especially in patients with pre-existing renal impairment or those at increased risk due to sepsis. So HEDA starch solutions can impair blood coagulation and platelet function, which may increase the risk of bleeding. And this effect can persist for several days after HEDA starch is administered. So this is another situation where it's not widely used anymore and careful consideration of benefits versus risks should be considered. Gelatin solutions are last and are used in cases of hypovolemia from hemorrhage or trauma or surgery. In the early management of patients with extensive burn injuries, gelatin colloid solutions may be used to support fluid resuscitation. So the cautions are gonna be relatively similar for the gelatin solutions as are the other colloidal solutions we've talked about up until now. As with other colloids, they have the potential to cause hypersensitivity. So again, it's really important to obtain an allergy history. These solutions are excreted by the kidneys as with most of the IV solutions we've discussed. So their use may affect renal function as is the case with HEDA starch and dextran. So you can see that there are precautions you need to take and consider when using all different IV solutions. One of the most important ways to avoid complications is to know how to calculate fluid requirements. So click here to see exactly how this is done and the shortcut that makes this really, really super easy. That'll do it for today. I'm Danielle Minetti and this has been Lucid Med. So if this video helped you understand IV solutions and the precautions you need to observe when using them, like, subscribe, comment, share it with a colleague, do all of it. It'll help YouTube understand our audience better and more will be able to find the information they're looking for. And if you have a topic or a question that you want more information on, drop a comment or email me at danielle at lucidmed.com. I answer every one of those comments and emails and I'm happy to do so. So with that, stay healthy and lucid and I'll see you over in the next video.